week, we not only had some excitement here, uh, but there was a little bit more excitement up in Washington uh, with the beginning of the hearings for the Supreme Court uh, nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. Well, it's all about, uh, you know, the law. Uh, it's all about application of the law. And I thought that was uh, interesting. I didn't watch any of those proceedings, but I heard uh, some reports about them. It sounds to me like uh, maybe they you know, could have been carried out in a little bit, a little bit more civil. I'm not sure. Maybe that's the right word. But but I'm come to this uh, passage in the book of, of James. Um, uh, you know, James is one that talks a lot about uh, not only hearing the word, uh, but doing the word as well. The fact is that's the the Division at the, towards the end of chapter one in my in the ESV Bible that I'm holding that says hearing and doing the word of God you really need both and that's what that's kind of the theme that James hits on in this letter you need both you know when I was growing up in New Jersey I lived across the street there was uh, from a, a little river it was a small river uh, but big enough to go boating on and things like that and every once in a while um, I would go out on a boat and have to row uh, and if you if you only had one oar to row. Uh, you had to do both sides, didn't you? If you're anybody here ever do any other, do some rowing? A few of us, not a whole lot. But uh, if you only have one oar, you have to hit both sides. Otherwise, you just go in a circle. The same thing is true if you have two oars, and you, but you only use one. You have to have both sides going. Otherwise, you'll just go in circles. So if one oar was uh, faith, when you, and you just base yourself, your life on that, you're going to go in a circle. If the other one is works, you base your life on that one, you're just going to go in a circle. You're not going to be accomplishing what you want, and to a significant degree, when we uh, apply it to spiritual truth, we're not going to be glorifying God. So that's kind of what uh, what uh, James is hitting on, on here. And he, and he gives us this example about showing partiality. And that's just an example, uh, because in a way you could say the way we treat others regardless of social status, will either reveal or conceal God's glory. And of course, we want to be agents of revealing His glory. The very first verse in our reading that John read a moment ago, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. It is a lot about God's glory. Now, before I go any further, let me just set the context just a little bit for this. Because, first off, it's the assembly. He talks about the assembly in verse 2. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly. Remember, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. And he's writing, in a sense, to the church gathered, just like we are here this morning. Uh, And if somebody comes in, it's dressed one way. Somebody comes in dressed a completely different way. We don't know anything else about them. We should treat them both the same. And so that's where he emphasizes the appearance. If a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, then it's going to tell a lot about what we believe about God the way we treat them. And it doesn't mean that if somebody were to come in and he or she was a dignitary and you knew that, then they would be worthy of giving some extra honor to. But just based on appearances, once we, before we get to know somebody where they may be a dignitary or somebody of high standing in the, in the community, uh, we, we treat everybody alike. And even sometimes after we do get to know them, we still treat them. I remember stories about um, uh, times in the past where uh, some ex-convicts heard this through uh, my Kairos ministry of years ago. Ex-convicts would come to a church, and uh, some people, knowing they were ex-convicts, would shun them, uh, but others would welcome them gratefully. And there was one occasion where one convict came up and kneeled at, at full communion, and who came next to him? but it was the judge that sentenced him to years in prison. And they took communion right next to each other. They treated each other as brothers in the Lord, which is the way it should be. But anyway, it is based on appearance here. Uh, 
That's the first thing I want to say. And then I want to jump down for a moment down here to verse 8. Verse 8 reads, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. We read that scripture just earlier. We read it uh, two or three times a month. Uh, on the summary of the law, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, they called it, calls it a royal law because it's a law that really belongs to the king, so to speak, the king in those days. And so in that sense, we would want to obey the law because the king has power. Not only that, but the king takes care of us. In that culture of that day, and even other cultures around the world today, the king is the one that provides protection for all of the subjects that are there. It allows them to, to live freely, to go about their business, uh, and to, to make a living for themselves. And so, because it's a royal law belonging to the king, we want to obey it. But it's also based on the scripture. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture... Well, that means we must obey it. That's why we recite the summary of the law so many times. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. We must obey it. And to dismiss that, uh, it is to ignore this facet of God's glory. Even to put a blinder up, if you will, to where God, where people who need to see God's glory through us working out will not be able to see it. So we not only want to obey it, we must obey it, but then he also says a little bit later on that we can obey it. This is what I want to spend just a few moments with you on. He goes on to, to reading from verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. You know, we don't like to hear about judgment, do we? And he, remember, he's writing to Christians, but yet he says we're going to be judged. And so, but it's a, it's a law of liberty that he, he makes reference to. And backing up, you know, to this where he says, you know, if you don't commit, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, I'm sure nobody here has committed murder, literal murder. But remember what Jesus said in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, that if you speak ill against your brother, that's the same in, in, their, in God's eyes as murder. And so, who have you spoken ill of that you can remember? Even if it was maybe decades ago. Does anybody come to mind? If somebody comes to mind, I would encourage you, well, if it's possible to contact them, call them. Maybe ask them for forgiveness, because maybe they'll remember it too. They may not. But that'll say something uh, to them. It will maybe reveal God's glory to them if they need to hear that. But he talks about so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Law of liberty. What is it? it sounds like an oxymoron to me. Law is a bunch of you shall do this, you shall not do that. But liberty is freedom. Freedom to do, freedom to choose, freedom to, well, do whatever you really want. So is it a law? Is it liberty? Well, let me give you an example. I remember... I remember growing up uh, in Little Silver, New Jersey. Uh, lived at uh, 304 Branch Avenue, and just a, a few, one block up, the next road was a road called Pinckney Road, and it was one of the wider roads. It was still two-lane road, but it was wider. And I heard about uh, some uh, guys that I knew in high school had gotten their driver's license, had had their license for a while, and they started to race down Pinckney Road. I'm guessing the speed limit was probably 30, maybe. Well, when you're racing, you don't worry about speed limits, do you? One of those guys lost control of his car, went off the car, went off the road, and hit a, a person who was standing in his front yard and killed him. Now, he paid the penalty for that. If he had followed 
the law of, follow, of not racing, but also following the speed limit, he would have lived into liberty. He would have lived into freedom. He would have maintained his freedom. But because he refused the law, he lost his freedom. He was charged and convicted for manslaughter. He knew what he was doing was wrong. That's the definition of manslaughter. And somebody could get hurt. Somebody did get hurt. Somebody, somebody died. So it's not really an oxymoron, per se, at all. Or think about also, uh, just to, in a way of thinking, moving out of a mindset of law, uh, but into a mindset of freedom, but not ignoring the law, we can use other analogies. I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, have had to go to the doctor occasionally. Obviously, I just went last week. Um, and we go to the doctor because something's ailing us, and then what happens if we don't take the doctor's advice? We probably most likely continue with the ailment. And depending upon what the ailment is, our debilitation could be extreme. It could even lead to our death. But we might say, but I don't want to go through that procedure. I don't want you to cut up my toe. I don't want to go through that operation. But if we ignore that, it's very possible that we will lose all of our liberty. So the law and liberty work together. They're two, like the, like the rowing, like two sides of a coin, two sides of a sheet of paper. They all belong together. Law versus grace. There's really not necessarily any conflict there. <clears throat> and there's no conflict between Paul writing here that if, your work, if you're not doing your works, then your faith is dead. Conflict with Paul where he says, by grace through faith are you saved. No, again, two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same sheet of paper. Our obedience then becomes a responsive obedience rather than a meritorious obedience. And that's something that we touched on that John Schuler, who whose the video we showed uh, earlier today at Christian Ed, kind of talked about. The more we live into that, the more it wells up within us the joy. The joy of walking with the Lord. The joy of knowing the Lord. And that's where, where James is helping uh, this, this group of, of believers to understand that after experiencing the grace and the forgiveness of God, then obedience isn't a chore anymore. It's, it becomes a delight. And so he was trying to clear up their, their thinking on that, on that. So how is it? What is it that you could do this week? What is it that maybe has happened to you recently? And you say, well, okay, I, maybe I could have done something for somebody over here, but I just didn't want, didn't want to do it. Or, I hated doing it because I know I'm supposed to. How can you adjust your thinking to understand that when God calls us to do something, it becomes a joy for us. It becomes a pleasure for us. Or more of a pleasure than it already is. Count it all joy. My brothers, he starts this letter with, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. <coughs> because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And living in even more to the fullness of liberty as well. And learning more, greater depth of what it means to live in liberty. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we don't earn our salvation, but we show we are saved by what we do. And we thank you for that grace. So, Father, open our eyes that as we go through life and we see an opportunity to, to maybe help someone, and most especially to help someone in the, the family of faith, that we would step forward in faith and uh, reach out to do the help that we can. That you would be glorified, Lord Christ, that it was all about glory coming, coming to you. So bless us, Father, that we might be a means of you blessing others through us. And by us, may your kingdom expand throughout Winter Haven and across the globe. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.